Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to uh, this interactive seminar, or at least as interactive as we can make it, uh, on applying to 3PB barristers and uh, hints and tips for applications and indeed for interviews. Um, I do hope that it will be of use to you. I, I do have to remind you that it does relate to 3PB um, and that other chambers often have different requirements and they have different ways of dealing with things. However, much of what I say will have a general applicability, so uh, pens out or keyboards ready uh, and take notes. Um, do remember that whilst it's frustrating that different chambers have different emphasis and you have to answer different questions on the gateway for different chambers or they have their own off the gateway process, um, that is what actually makes this profession great, because it means that different kinds of people can have access. Before I start, can I just remember any, remind um, anyone who doesn't know that uh, we have a great deal of information and help on our website at 3PB um, in the pupillage section. And all the documents I refer to can be found there with, with lots more. Um, including our Two Pupillage and Beyond video series, uh, which we ran last year with our pupils and members of chambers, which takes you in the complete arc from the moment that you apply right the way through to obtaining silk. And it's quite interesting. So do look out for that. Um, there are lots of hints and tips on there already for applying for pupillage, for application forms, for interviews, what we're looking for and what we're not looking for, and a very helpful grid that takes you through how we mark the application. Uh, and to be quite frank, I think that's probably the single most useful piece of paper on there. So do have a look at it. In regards of today, I'm going to divide into three sections, classic advocacy, Look, watch and learn. Uh, so first of all, I'm going to deal with what is the process uh, and how does it work? Secondly, um, what can you do on your application form and during interviews to stand out from the crowd? And thirdly, I will then, um, uh, I will then, sorry, somebody is saying, can I restart the stream? I'm afraid I can't, no. Um, the question and answer, uh, if, if, you, if you've asked questions and answers, I will deal with it at the end because I can't stop in the middle and deal with things and it will be helpful to see all the questions towards the end. Um, if you put them in the sidebar um, as we go through, I'll pick some of them up, but you might want to wait until towards the end because um, your, your questions might well be answered. It's a little distracting when the, the questions come up um, and I can't deal with them. So um, if you just hold fire and then um, wait until the end, and if I haven't already answered your question, then answer it. So what is the applications process at 3PB and why do you need to know about it? Um, the answer to the second part is this. Um, if you don't know how the nuts and bolts work, if you don't know what Chambers is looking for and how Chambers operates its system as best you can, because some Chambers put out more information than others, then it's really difficult to craft your application and to hone your skills for interviews. So at 3PB, we have had for numbers of years um, a fair and open a process as we are able to achieve. Um, we have recruited, if you, look at, if you look at our pupils, you can see we've recruited um, a varied, eclectic, highly diverse, but uniformly excellent group of pupils. And so um, if you fit into that category, we want to hear from you. So here is your path to pupillage. I hope you can see that. This is a document which is available on the website and in those uh, halcyon days when we could actually meet at pupillage fairs and talk to people, we would have these as handouts. So this is our application and interview pro processes here at 3PB. Um, obviously, at the moment, everything is being done remotely. So uh, the interviews are done on Zoom. So we start off quite early on in, cham in Chambers. Uh, recruiting people to mark, recruiting people to interview. 
because you have to remember that it's busy barristers who do all this work. Very few chambers, if any, have a human resources department. So before your portal even opens, we are working on setting the, um, the questions, on putting everything together. We put a great deal of work into our process. We know how much work you put into your applications. Uh, and we think it's very, very important for us to honor that work that you do, take it very seriously, and put a lot of time into it ourselves. Um, when the portal opens, obviously, um, you are doing your uh, applications. Uh, we, in the meantime, are running practice runs for people who are going to mark the application forms. It doesn't just happen. Um, we need to have uniformity throughout it. One person can't possibly mark all the applications we get. We tend to get about 250 to 300 applications a year. Um, they take a lot of time to mark. So um, we like to have it uniform. Now, we're a little unusual, I think, in many ways. We double mark everything. So there are two people who do a very careful mark of your application form. This means that uh, mistakes that you make are likely to be picked up. Uh, and secondly, more importantly, that the good things that you get in there uh, are picked up by at least one person, if not by both. We have a system whereby if there is a difference between the markers uh, in the marks, it's looked at by a third marker um, because not every application fits into a box. We know this. Um, and we want to just make sure that everybody who applies to us has the fairest, um, has the fairest chance to get an interview. So we get to the interview. Uh, we get to the application forms. And um, the portal closes, and um, that's when our work really starts. And um, I'm going to take you through now what we look for. We'll come back to that later, but I'll take you now through, through what, what we look for and what can make you stand out from the crowd with an application form, because at this particular time, I suspect that's what you're most interested in. So. By the time you finish the temp seminar, I hope you'll at least have some idea and some tools uh, to make the most of your qualities and attributes. We mark on competencies. So the first thing you need to know is that we don't know who you are. We take your name off your application. We don't know which, and we don't care which school you went to. We don't take into account which university you went to. Um, if anybody wants to have a discussion about that some other time, uh, we can do so, but there are very sound reasons for doing that. So we look at your degree, what you've achieved. We look at what you've achieved since. We take no notice of your A-levels because, quite frankly, you took them quite a long time ago by the time we're marking, uh, and you're possibly a completely different person now. So we look at what you're doing now. We look for what we call exit velocity. So for where, where have you started? We want to see that you are actually on an upward swing so that when you come to us as a pupil, you can continue on that upward swing all the way through to tenancy and hopefully whatever your ambition is, whether it be judiciary or silk uh, or something else. But we want somebody who is uh, able to develop further and um, is on, as I say, that upward swing. So when you are looking to do your application form, what, what, what are we looking for? Um, well, the first thing we look for is a very well prepared application form, something just thrown on to piece of paper. And you'd be surprised how many we get like that. Um, so prepare, practice, write out your submissions and your answers to questions several times make sure that it looks right. Write it out actually in different formats because sometimes it looks fine um, in one format and then you read it to yourself and realize that uh, it's actually not very good at all. I still do that with my skeleton arguments. Um, make sure that your spelling and grammar are correct. Um, it's something which surprises me that we have had applications for pupillage where the word pupillage has been misspelt, it doesn't engender much 
confidence uh, and to be quite frank given the very high quality of people who apply to the bar now and people who apply to us in particular um, spelling something wrongly repeatedly is likely to be fatal to your application um, use a layout which is as attractive as you can make it um, we're all marking we, each of our markers marks at least 50 and um, a solid block of text uh, with nothing breaking it up um, can be very dispiriting on a Saturday afternoon. Um, so break it up, use bullet points, um, use um, uh, numbered paragraphs if you can um, within the answers to questions or when you're dealing with, for example, mini pupillages. Don't ramble please um you'll get yourself in a knot um and we basically don't really have time uh, to untangle all the knots shorter sentences are easier to read and uh, help us set out a different sentence for each thing you want to say and, and please don't repeat yourself we read them carefully saying something three times does not make it three times more impressive it just makes it three times more irritating your task filling in the application form is to persuade us it's it's it is basically written advocacy and written advocacy is not hammering people with one point again and again it just doesn't work particularly doesn't work with busy barristers be careful with the language that you use um, don't think we're going to be impressed if you use long words sometimes a long word or an unusual word is the right one to use but often it isn't so for example don't refer to tomes instead of books unless there is a specific reason for it we're not impressed we're just you're just showing off and don't there are some depressingly common mistakes please look up things that you use for example I see repeatedly people saying, I did my utmost to do something. Well, in fact, it's not utmost, it is utmost with a T. You have the internet, check things. It's wonderful for that. It's not just for looking at cats, you know. On the same point, before you use a word, ask yourself if you know what it means. If you do not know what it means, don't use it because the chances are you're using it wrongly. And using a word wrongly as a barrister it is a really bad mistake and it won't endear you to Chambers. Or look it up and find some examples of it being used so that you can be sure that the word you're using is being used appropriately uh, and isn't irritating somebody. Don't be monodimensional. What do I mean by that? I mean, by this that you may have something that you thought was absolutely fantastic really wonderful for example you might be thrilled that you won a mooting competition but mentioning it five times in your application doesn't do a thing for you mention it once possibly twice if it comes into your answer to uh, an advocacy question for example um, but um, don't keep banging on about it we get we get it you won a mooting competition Similarly, if you have a particular fascination for growing marrows, takes all sorts, um, don't bring the joys of marrow growing into every single section. Once is sufficient and link it to a quality needed by a barrister. Be very, very careful um, with humour. A wry comment can be amusing. An attempt to be funny is not. If you're not sure, leave it out. And don't be aggressive. This may again come as a surprise to many people, but uh, people are in fact quite aggressive sometimes. It's almost they're in your face, they're, they're almost to bully you into giving them an interview. That doesn't work either. We're not very bullyable, most of us. Um, and it will simply uh, it will simply not work. We look at the information. 
This is not Facebook. This is not LinkedIn. We're not interested in the minutiae of your life, and we do not want you to be proud, humbled, or any other emotion particularly. Uh, be professional. That's what we ask of you. Demonstrate that you can be professional. We particularly have difficulty with humble brag, that is somebody pretending to be hum humble while absolutely bragging about something they've done. Um, and we also dislike illustrations of which try to show how stupid everyone else is and how clever you are. Uh, it's not a comparative exercise. We want to know who you are. Uh, what anybody else has or has not done is irrelevant to us. So that's some basics uh, on filling it in. And um, so we're just going to have a quick look now at the application form, uh, if I can find it. I'm sure you've all seen this, and this, in fact, may be the slightly older one, but um, I'm just going to take you through it and just explain what we look at and give you some hints and tips as you go through the application form. So obviously you need to fill in your personal details. Uh, that line is through there to demonstrate that we actually don't have access to that information when you're marking it. Um, similarly with your school education, don't care which school you went to, we take no notice of O levels or A levels. Um, partly because it was a long time ago and partly because the history of A-levels is now so checkered that uh, it is difficult to draw a line between somebody who did their A-levels three, four years ago and somebody who did them maybe seven, eight or even more years ago. Um, so we simply take no notice of them. We don't take any notice, as I said earlier, of your university, but we do naturally take notice of your um, of the degree that you uh, have have obtained uh, and what level it is. You should know that when we do our marking, which is um, our, our marking is done on competencies, but the intellectual part of it counts double compared with anything else. The others that we look at, uh, just so that you're aware, is judgment. We look at drive and determination. We look at um, your ability to get on with people and we look at your commitment to the bar and to 3PB in particular. I'll deal with that a little later on. Um, employment history. Let's just have a quick, um, a quick look at this. Uh, Legal employment is where you get to structure your stuff on legal experience, including things like attending mini pupillages. And I'm encouraging people this year, when so few have been able to have mini pupillages, to set out perhaps the seminars that they attended. The online seminars has been quite a lot around. Um, and um, I think that counts to a certain extent as a mini pupillage. Um, it is not an opportunity to put down every single thing you've done in a separate box it can get very, very tedious. There's nothing worse than just leading, reading a list of I went on a mini pupillage here, I went on a mini pupillage there. If you've done a number of web webinars or attended talks, that kind of thing, you could use one box and then set it out um, with um, with bullet points. So um, you could say under responsibilities achievements, because that's the only place you can actually put it in. Uh, you could say, for example, attended 3PB to pupillage and beyond parts one and two, then tell us what you learned. Because one of the things that will really help lift you is to say, I did this and I learned that. You'll find different ways of doing it, make it a bit more interesting. Um, so, for example, you could say, uh, I attended the 3PB to pupillage and beyond parts one and two, in which I learned about the path to pupillage and the different paths one can take after completion. I was particularly interested to discover how being seconded can add a great deal of value to being a self-employed barrister, or that one can discover a new area of law even in pupillage, or whatever it is you feel that you did learn from it. And if you didn't learn anything from it, there's either something wrong with the seminar or there's something wrong with you. Um, 
Secondly, I, I attended the Bedford Row, being a pupil, a very good one, by the way, you can find it uh, out on YouTube, I think, uh, being a pupil, which gave me a real insight into the day to day life of being a pupil and then whatever else you've done. Mini pupillages, if you have been fortunate to attend something uh, which could be termed a mini pupillage, and I know, again, we know how difficult it's been and we're tremendously sympathetic. Um, Mini pupillages can be dealt with in the same way. If you haven't done them yet, please don't put them in separate boxes. Just say these are the ones I'm going to do. You can't say what you've learned. You could make you could make a comment. I, I hope to learn more about X, Y and Z because you could demonstrate where your interests lie. Um, but please don't don't do a separate one because um, it makes your application form unbelievably long uh, and doesn't assist us very much. Um, they can get very samey, even if you're talking about ones that you have already done. So um, again, you could do it with bullet points if you wanted to. Uh, but my best tips for, for dealing with mini pupillages and getting something over, bearing in mind that you're not just reciting what you've done, because that's fairly meaningless. Um, you are trying to persuade us that um, you do a mini pupillage and you learn things. You're really involved. You're really enthusiastic. Um, and you really take take moments. Can you just excuse me one second? My cat has decided she wants to go out. Hold on. So tell us what you've learned and uh, not just what you saw. So. I attended the Court of Appeal. Yeah, whoopsie do. But what did you learn there? Also, don't um, please don't exaggerate what you did on a mini pupillage. Um, when I see something like I drafted a skeleton for the Court of Appeal and I do see things like that. Um, no, 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 you didn't. Really, you didn't. You drafted a skeleton for a case going to the Court of Appeal and got feedback on it. And um, that's as far as you can say, say what you learned from the feedback. Um, we don't really care what other pu chambers think about you. So it's no good saying I did a mini pupillage and they said I was absolutely brilliant because it, it, it's got very little evidential value. Um, and we may not um, be looking for the same kind of pupil as that particular chambers is looking for. So you might well shoot yourself in the foot as well. Um, don't just give list details of cases that you saw. Um, it doesn't tell us anything really about you. And this is about you. Always, always about you. Um, it's about you telling us how marvellous you are without actually saying I am marvellous, because we, we'd probably find that a little bit um, unrealistic. Um, so you could say something like this. I had the opportunity to attend a virtual hearing. I got some excellent tips on advocacy and how a hearing on Microsoft Teams works. I was very impressed by the way the advocates dealt with a challenging judge or whatever. You could say something like, although I'm not interested in family law, I found the hearing into financial issues after divorce very interesting. And I admired how council were able to deal with the emotional parties. Um, or something as simple as it was interesting and very helpful to see the difference in the way the tribunals and the courts are run. Other legal work can include volunteering for various pro bono organizations. Um, again, don't just tell us that you've done it, because to be quite frank, these days, uh, practically everybody has done some form of volunteering. Um, so the fact that you volunteered. We like the fact that you volunteered and we, we mark people who volunteered, you, you get extra tick boxes on the dealing with people, the empathy side of things. Um, but um, simply saying I volunteered with X doesn't tell us very much. So. Um, say what you did volunteering, say what you've learned from it. Tell us why this particular volunteering experience. And can I just pause for a minute here and say your volunteering experience does not have to be legally based, um, certainly not for us. Um, we know that people 
um, sometimes have difficulty doing voluntary work. They may have financial issues. They may need to be working at the same time as they're studying and they simply can't go off uh, and do uh, unpaid volunteering or not much of it, or they may not have the option to do something legal. So we're quite open-minded about how you show us the empathy and how you deal with the volunteering. So for example, um, if you have uh, volunteered with your local religious organization to um, take children uh, out to the countryside, uh, for example, um, that's quite a good one because you can use that. Think about what we're looking for. Uh, we're looking for empathy with people. We're looking for people who can organize. So you can say that you organized. You can say that you learned about safeguarding and had to go through all the safeguarding processes. This is positive, good stuff, which we will mark you well on. Um, mooting is not work experience. Please don't put it in the work experience. It won't get any marks. Um, you can deal with the mooting later on or in the specific question that we have about advocacy. Uh, jury service isn't legal work experience either. It's very interesting and try and slip it in somewhere, but it's definitely not legal work experience. You're not really working, you're a juror. Um, so there, there is a question about whether or not writing a blog um, is legal work experience. Um, I think that I'm, if, if it's a regular blog and it's got quite a lot of readers, yes, why not? Um, but um, or if you have written articles for um, magazines or online um, resources, by all means, get that in as well. It is quite flexible. Everything you can get in there that's to do with law, but please not mooting, uh, as I said. Um, then you've got your non-legal employment. Fairly obvious. Um, almost anything else, really. Um, Use in this particular um, box, use the um, responsibility, responsibilities and achievements box, not only for what you did, but what you learned and how it relates to the qualities required by a barrister. Um, for example, um, with other work experience, you worked in a pizzeria, lovely. But if you just put out ingredients per preparation, pizza making and baking, waiting on tables and operating the till, yeah, well, that, we know that, that's what you worked in a pizzeria, but what, what did that give you? What did you learn? What qualities did you have to have to do that which relate to being a barrister? It's really important that you do this with everything. Um, and be a little bit careful um, about um, what you say about when you've had experiences, when you've been working, don't do anything that looks like it breaches uh, data protection because we have had that happen uh, and it's a really bad idea. Um, the other skills, obviously, um, languages, we don't give specific marks for languages. We are impressed by languages. They can just push your intellectual uh, mark up a little bit, um, depending on what the language is uh, and uh, how skilled you are, but it doesn't have a great deal of weight. Um, Right, responsibilities, awards and interests. So positions of responsibility, if you've already mentioned these in the employment se section, it's not necessary to repeat everything. Um, you can just, again, use uh, my, my favorite, um, uh, just, just use some, some marks or um, numbers. And uh, so you can say something like, as set out above, I was a manager with Pret-a-Manger as a paralegal with responsibility for my own caseload, whatever and then add anything that you haven't already dealt with. So something like, uh, in addition, I was captain of the school and university baseball teams. This taught me how to manage people and expectations as well as taking responsibility. Um, I was responsible for organizing visits for children who attend my local mosque, negotiating with parents, helping to raise funds, that kind of thing. Um, so um, 
again, relate it always to you, what you learned, and why that relates to being a barrister. Um, references I'm not going to deal with. We don't look at references until you get through to uh, about the, the second interview. Scholarships, awards and prizes. Yes, we do need to know about these. Uh, we want to know about in scholarships. We want to know about university prizes or in prizes. Um, we want to know if you've won an essay competition. We want to know that anything else current and relevant to your intellectual capacity and abilities. We don't want to know about your sporting achievements or your swimming. Thank you. We don't want to know anything about what you won at school because that's so, so long ago. It's, it's practically meaningless. Um, and we don't want to know about any non-academic awards unless they relate to your academic achievements. Um, something like a person of the year award at work or in your community, but um, only a fairly recent. And we don't want to know about random things you won in a draw um, or random things that anybody can do that you didn't learn anything from. So you then get to your interests and um, non-work related uh, involvement. Um, this is the point at which you can talk about your sporting, knitting, baking, writing, racing, novels, etc. Um, but be careful. We've accidentally caught people out. We don't at 3PB ever try to catch people out deliberately. But do not claim something you can't back up. Uh, your interviewers are likely to be fairly eclectic bunch with a very wide range of interests. And claiming to be, for example, an expert on the Japanese tea ceremony uh, may well result in a question as to whether you contrib consider it contributes to wabi or sabi, or if it can represent the balance of the two. And if you have bigged up something that you went to and you can't answer that question, you're going to look like a fool. So be very careful. We don't want you to look like a fool. Um, so our marking scheme doesn't actually include your hobbies, but it does. It, it, it is taken into account when we look at the overall persuasiveness, balance and structure of your application form. Every part of it should be polished and completed. Uh, you can relate your hobby or sport or whatever it is you, your interests are to a quality required in a barrister or say that it helps you keep your balance um, and is important for your well-being. Um, one other thing I want to talk about is extenuating circumstances. All of us suffer slings and arrows of outrageous fortune um, and a certain amount of resilience is required. I don't think I need to lecture to anybody at the moment about resilience. I have been um, astounded by the way in which so many um, university students, people doing the BPTC and people looking for pupillage have risen um, to the challenge of the last year. Um, and I am extremely impressed. But a few hints on what not to say in your extenuating circumstances. A string of minor events used as an excuse simply makes you look as if you're unable to cope with day to day problems. Um, if you have medical problems, detailed explanations really are not required just tell us about them if you think they're relevant and if they're necessary but you don't need to go into details uh, and in many ways we'd rather you didn't um this year covid is going to be an issue for everybody um if you have a specific issue uh, such as the bsb mess up of the exams um or you have had covid uh, or you have been badly affected by it in some way, that is fine. But if it's just, hasn't it been awful? Yes, it has. We agree with you, but we don't need to be told. We've lived through it as well. Some things will be very powerful, and it really helps us to know about them, particularly if you are um, a little on the edge on the, intellect, you know, the intellectual side, maybe have a 2-1, but you might have got a, a first. Um, so serious illnesses and accidents leading up to exams, serious personal problems, close bereavements, bereavements of those close to you, uh, very close to exams, things like being caught in earthquakes, floods, etc., or stranded, it, it has happened. Um, the categories aren't closed, but ask yourself if the incident you rely on um, 
is powerful and genuine or whether you're using it as an excuse because it will come over as an excuse if it's not um, if it's not something that really really affected you um, we ask seven questions um, on the uh, on our application um, and we get an awful lot of our answers from and, and a lot of our marks come from the questions uh, which are specifically pointed at the areas in which we are marking so take your time general pointers answer the question we ask might seem obvious but numbers of applicants either don't read the question at all or try to shoehorn information into a question not designed for it our system is carefully calibrated and you will only get marks if you answer the question um, be concise be precise don't ramble uh, choose your examples very carefully and deal with all the elements in the question um, for example uh, one of our questions is we ask you to describe a mistake that you've made uh, and how you dealt with it so choose a mistake you made not a mistake by someone else that you've solved this has happened we had we've had several times when people have said well i didn't make this mistake but look how marvelous i was sorting it out that doesn't help us um, we are looking for you to acknowledge that you make mistakes that you own those mistakes and that you deal with them we also want to know what the outcome was if there was one make sure it is a mistake the two that come up quite often which people try to use as mistakes um, just don't get anywhere it shows bad judgment so this is one we get quite often I worked too hard I worked so hard to get a first and it was a mistake because and then I didn't have a good enough social life and I've learned from this that I need a work-life balance or conversely I didn't work hard enough to get a first because I had a life and I wanted a work-life balance what both of those tell us is not what I think you think it's telling us uh, what it's telling us is that actually you don't think you're clever enough to get a first and have a life so be very careful you might be giving us the wrong message without realizing it also don't tell us you chose the wrong a levels a we don't mark a levels uh, and b it's so long ago we don't really care also you chose them it's not a mistake um, the best mistake um, we ever had was one which started off i learned not to be my own plumber as soon as you read that you want to read more and he goes on to explain how he had a dripping tap tried to fix it himself uh, ended up flooding the kitchen uh, and having to get somebody in who knew what they were doing and what he learned from that uh, to, to be frank was uh, if you don't know something you don't know something and ask an expert um, we will ask you uh, at some stage to whether you want to join you know why you want to join 3pb it's one of the classic questions that we ask why do you want to join 3pb and you need to demonstrate a knowledge of our set there's a lot of information on our website uh, you can pick something out you can um, find a case that we were involved in recently you can there's a lot you can say and it's surprising the number of people who don't answer that part of the question you don't have to big us up you don't have to over flatter us um, we uh, we pick up uh, people trying to uh, pull the wool over our eyes or, or be too smarmy but we need you to demonstrate that um, you know something about us uh, and that you really want to join us um, the other questions that we ask um, if I can just find them um, we ask why do you believe you'll make a good barrister it's a an awful question to be quite frank uh, it's fractionally above why do you want to be a barrister because the answer to why do I want to be a barrister is well I do it's actually quite hard to answer but uh, so we ask you why do you believe you'll make a good barrister so what we're looking for you to do on this is to 
identify what you think a good barrister is and then explain uh, why uh, you are that good barrister. Um, things such as everyone has always told me with, I'm, that I'm good with words and I'm very persuasive and so I'll make a good barrister doesn't cut any ice. It doesn't really tell us very much. Similarly, and this is taken from something somebody did actually say, uh, my father is a barrister and so I know I'll be very good at it. That doesn't help very much either. Um, what you need to do is, is identify one or two things and then relate your, your experience to it. So something like a good barrister has exceptional research, research, research skills that can translate into written and oral advocacy, which are skills I have sought to develop. I began with uh, an academically stringent subject choice that provided a varied educational background. Um, these skills have been sharpened further by studying law to master's level in this particular case, um, where I've achieved consistency in the quality of my arguments. I've applied my skills beyond my studies, working to become an accomplished advocate in both oral and written formats. Things like that. Um, when working with clients, demonstrating that you know you have to work with clients, I maintain absolute integrity and compassion and work diligently to the um, best of my abilities, providing clear and concise legal documents. Something along those lines, um, or even something much shorter, uh, it is the combination of a strong legal and intellectual background with articulously motivation and integrity that gives me the confidence in my ability to succeed at the bar. So that's actually a short way of doing it, but it says it very nicely. Um, again, uh, why 3PB, which is, is one of the questions we ask. Um, bad example. 3PB does family law, which I would like to do. Uh, yeah, but why 3PB? Why do you want to come to us? What is it about us that makes you excited? Uh, if you're not excited to come to us, then um, we, we probably won't be too excited for you to come to us either. Um, something uh, along the lines of this, it's, it's a little bit maybe overblown, but it, it, it does the job. It would be an honour and privilege to work with such a prestigious set of chambers at 3PB, which makes us feel really good about ourselves. Um, 3PB has demonstrated its accomplishments since it opened in 1892, so they've looked up the website and looked at our history. Uh, numerous members of 3PB have gone on to hold high judicial office, which demonstrates that 3PB instills the skills required to become successful, and I would very much like to be a part of that. So we, we're sitting there feeling, oh, you like us, we, we like you too, uh, but also really demonstrating that you know something about us. Um, so I've dealt with the mistake one, um, don't, some do's and don'ts. Um, the, um, the bad one, uh, a bad one is I left home late the day I had my conference practicing assessment. I got stuck in traffic and realized that I would be late for it. Uh, so I asked a colleague if she could speak to the tutor and take my place instead, which she did. Now that doesn't do a thing for anybody. First of all, you've admitted, they've admitted that they were late leaving, not a good quality for a barrister, um, got stuck in traffic, um, realized that they would be late and asked a colleague to do it instead. Well, what have you learned from it? Um, so um, be careful, give us a mistake that's a real mistake. We ask you for, um, obstacles. I've already mentioned a couple of those, but um, for a lot of people, one of the major obstacles is money, and we appreciate this. Um, but it is something which affects a vast number of, number of people, and there are only limited ways in which you can deal with it by getting scholarships. If you've got a scholarship, that will count towards your intellectual um, attainments. Um, or if you've worked part time, that will that will already count towards your drive and determination. Um, you can mention it if you like, but um, come come up with something a little bit more, um, if you can, a little bit more focused and perhaps a, a little narrower. Um, 
we, we had one where somebody uh, told us that their obstacle was that they had to commute each way involving car, tra train and tube journeys. Well, a little less likely these days, but um, the, the fact is that that is something that we all have to do. If they had related that, which they didn't, um, to this gives me the real um, ability to, to run around the countryside as a second six and a junior tenant. Um, but again, it's just something that we practically take for granted that this is something you appreciate you're going to have to do and it's not particularly special. Um, whereas, um, and, and something like this, which um, really didn't help, uh, uh, I experienced a massive personal and social growth when I was in, when I was um, in my early 20s. I've always been very spiritual in self-development, but uh, when I visited um, Tibet, I took it to a new level and I started exercising more. I worked to grow the best parts of myself and leave the bad ones behind. It's not really an obstacle. It's just a description of something you did. Um, then we ask about advocacy. And this is your opportunity to structure stuff with your muting. Don't just tell us you've mooted. Don't just tell us you've done public speaking. And I have to be quite frank, you have got to... Um, uh, you have got to demonstrate some level of advocacy. We know it's been difficult with mooting as well this year, but there have been a lot of online moots. There are other things you can use public speaking, doing webinars, practically anything where you're speaking in public, we will take into account particularly this year. But saying something like this doesn't help. So uh, example here, I have a strong and successful record of mooting and public speaking. I was a finalist in X Chambers Moot. In addition, I was a finalist in the X Chambers Moot at uh, the X Moot hosted by the University of X. I also reached the semi-finals in another mooting championship and a regular participant in my INS Mooting Society. Yeah, fine. Uh, how did you do? What did you learn? Um, so somebody doing almost exactly the same said this in 2000 odd, I participated in the XX Chambers moot. I had to provide a bundle to the judges containing the case law. I felt best supported my client's position. And I embraced the opportunity to sift through and analyze the authorities in order to build the strongest case possible. I was successful in the round and progressed to the semi-final. So it's the same experience doing a moot, but we know much, so much more about this person and what they did and what they learned from it. And these are really, really important. It's really, really important that um, that you do that. Now, I'm just going to very quickly, um, because I can see that we're starting to run out of time, and I do want to answer as many of these questions as I can. Just talk very quickly about um, the um, the interviews, um, because you should be thinking beyond the application form. You should be thinking to towards the interviews as you're doing your application forms because you're going to be asked questions on your application form in our first round. Our second round is different with the, the people who interview you in a second round don't have your application form. You're, you're assessed purely on what you do in front of them. Um, I remember my pupillage interviews and I shudder um, even after all these years. It's awful and some chambers really ramp up the fear. We don't. Somebody asked a question about what our culture of chambers was. Now, I think I'm going to slip it in here because we are a chambers that wants everybody to do their best. We want you to do your best um, when you come to an interview. We want you to do your best as a pupil. We want you to do your best uh, as a tenant. And we want our, our colleagues to do their best as well. So we are very supportive as a chambers of everything. We have an excellent well-being process. Um, our pupils have access to a student, to a counsellor. Um, we have um, a, a buddy system with, with some of the junior tenants, um, and uh, that carries on. Um, even as a very senior member of Chambers, I can call somebody up and ask for help. Um, we have a reputation of being the friendliest or one of the friendliest um, uh, chambers, even during interviews. In fact, um, I think it causes a little bit of confusion because people come out going, I don't know how I did because they were all so nice to me. 
Um, and we do that because we want you to show off your best. We, we're not there to scare you or trick you or do any of that. Um, we're very courteous and we're very friendly, but we are still interviewing you. We're not your friends. Um, don't get too personal. On the other hand, if you can't speak to us, um, we can't assess you. Um, how you present yourself matters. Um, we will tell you to wear something smart and businesslike. Um, that's because I know all too well from personal experience that the term smart casual strikes terror into the hearts of a lot of us. Um, what on earth it means, uh, I have never quite worked out. I mean, my idea of smart casual is a pair of clean jeans and a jumper. Uh, but somebody else might think of it as a day dress and heels. Um, so uh, it's a bit difficult. We have a basic unisex dress code for our pupils, uh, which we would encourage anybody uh, coming to an interview to to follow uh, it's basically it's quite simple um, uh, professional dark and seemly don't overdo anything uh, that's it it's a unisex one by the way we genuinely don't mind what you wear as long as it's smart and businesslike uh, one extra tip in all our interviews we do know you're nervous we do know this. Um, we make allowances for it. If you're asked a question, if you're having difficulties, stop. Take a deep breath. Lean back. Say, just give me a moment. And then move forward. You don't have to answer immediately. And one other real tip, don't interrupt. If we're asking you a question, don't start speaking before we finished. Um, I have to say, I think this generation is going to find that easier because uh, we've been communicating on Zoom and uh, other platforms for so long where you can't talk across one another that, that I think there's a lot more courtesy and consideration going on generally. Um, that's um, all I'm going to say at the moment about mainly filling in the, the application form and the processes. Um, I'm going to um, start ans answering, answering questions now. Um, uh, I'm going to skip the international one for a second, Daryl, and I'll come back to BevAv. I'm working backwards. Gateway advertisement states that 3PB are looking for a pupil in criminal and one in family. Does that mean 3PB is not looking for pupils in other unrelated? No, it doesn't. Uh, we're looking for up to four. Uh, we would like to find one in family. We would like to find one in crime, um, but they're going to have to be good enough. Uh, the other two are at large. So, uh, no, uh, if you look at the numbers, you can see that uh, we're looking for up to four. Uh, and in fact, um, how many advocacy experiences should we list? Well, it depends on how many you've done, really. Um, I would. Our question on advocacy is, in fact, tell us about a time your advocacy made a difference. So you might want to concentrate on one, perhaps a, a short setting out of, of what you've done and then find a specific example where you made a difference uh, and explain what that difference was. Um, do you recommend um, applying after finishing university? Um, I've lost that one. Finishing university. Um, the difficulty with our system is that because we don't look at A-levels and we don't look at O-levels, um, that if you apply before you've got your, your degree, um, it's very, very difficult to mark because we mark to your degree. Um, also, we're normally recruiting for the following year, so um, uh, it can cause problems if, if you apply before, before your degree is done so um, other chambers are different uh, so if you're applying in your third year you're probably best off not applying to us um, right i'm just going to go down to the down to the bottom and start with the people who asked first so tamsin um how would i describe the culture at 3pb well i think i covered that we're friendly we're tough we're um uh outside we were very friendly very supportive with each other um, and our uh, clerks and admin staff are phenomenal so it's a really good place to work um, and a very very good place to be um, Tom you need to go back and um, have, have you sorted that out uh, there are two um, we, we, we put an advert up and then took it off but there is a live one. You need to go back and look. If you've got difficulties, can I suggest you connect you 
you contact James Thornton, who is our admin manager, and he will he will sort you out. Uh, can I give an example of what I mean by aggressive in applications? Um, we had somebody who responded to one of our questions. I think it was the mistake one, uh, starting off by saying this very weak question uh, basically doesn't relate to any of the information that I want to give you. Um, so that's what I mean by aggressive. Uh, in other words, trying to take over, trying to push back, trying to tell us what we should know rather than us telling you what we want to know. Um, so uh, what tips could you give for international students applying with the existing competition? We, um, If you've got your degree, um, we know uh, how that degree translates over to us. I mean, that can be a little bit more difficult. Um, you just apply. We, we've had numbers of, of international people um, apply to us. And in fact, uh, one of our pupils last year was effectively an international pupil. Uh, we've also taken on, um, we have an Australian who's come to us quite late, um, who was um, again an international pupil. So we don't, we don't differentiate. Um, if we're fortunate, um, how do you prepare for ethical questions? Well, you should have done your ethics uh, by the time you come for an interview. How do you prepare for it? Have a read of the barcode of conduct. Try and, and see um, what it is and what it isn't that you should do. Um, in fact, in, in many ways, if your gut tells you it's wrong, it's wrong. Um, but the answer to the ethical question sometimes can be, I really don't know. I would either phone the bar ethics hotline, if I can get hold of them, um, or I would ask a senior member of chambers um, before I did anything. So, so that's quite a, a good way of doing it. Um, prizes and scholarships, non-legal work settings or societies, if they are related to your intellectual abilities, yes, uh, we would like to know about them. Um, otherwise, no. Um, uh, will virtual mini pupillages have the same weight as traditional ones? Um, mini pupillages don't really have a great deal of weight, to, to be honest. I mean, we, we like to see about four of them uh, or some, a couple of mini or two or three mini pupillages with perhaps some work experience as a solicitor to show your drive and determination, to show the, your commitment uh, and to demonstrate that you actually have some idea of what you're getting into. Um, that's the main focus of mini pupillages. So um, for us, virtual ones this year will have exactly the same weight, um, because to be quite frank, it would be vastly unfair to people coming on stream now if that weren't the case. Um, can I include uh, work experience? Yes, of course. Of course. I mean, law firms are our, our major supplier of work. If you know how they work and you know how they function, you've got you're ahead of the game. Um, you understand what it is that the solicitor wants to know. And, and that's what you can put in. You can actually make, you know, fr from, from, from my work experience at X, I understood that this is what a solicitor wants and, and give a couple of examples. Works fine. Um, does virtual legal work experience as in person? Same answer. Yes, as much as possible. It depends on what it is. Uh, and and how much it's done. And I think I would advise anybody who's done anything virtual to um, to explain what it is they did, because it's one thing to um, uh, it, it is one thing to say, well, I did a, a virtual mini pupillage at X chambers, but we don't necessarily know what they're terming a virtual mini pupillage. Our virtual mini pupillages um, uh, are quite or will be, because I see somebody's asked if they're open. They should be, but there's been a bit of a hold up because of um, illness, unfortunately, and the, the current crisis. But uh, we will be running virtual ones. Um, ours are quite complicated. You get work to do, you get to attend, uh, you get to speak to numbers of members of chambers. So if you've done a virtual mini pupillage, please, please tell us what it was that you did under the responsibilities, just explain what it consisted of, because I know some chambers have held, if you like, more open evenings, maybe two or three hours talking to people, and they've called them virtual mini pupillages, which they're not really. Um, and um, so 
the virtual legal work experience, yes, put it in, tell, tell everything. Are mini pupillage applications open? Not yet, but, but keep an eye out. Um, how far you should you go with the non-legal work experience is presenting a radio show for three, three years between 2008 and 2011 still relevant? Yes, of course it is. It's really interesting. You've presented a radio show. You've talked about corpsing. Uh, it's a really, really, really good um, uh, quality for a barrister to have. So yes, mention it and, and link it like everything, link it. If you're learning another language currently, are three people interested? Yes, because it shows that you're, you're still looking to learn, you're still looking to grow. Because the essential thing about being a barrister, which you must understand, is that it doesn't stop the day you get tenancy. It continues the whole time. Um, I've been, I'm over 20 years call now, it doesn't feel like it, but it's over 20 years call. I'm still looking at new things. I'm still trying out new things. I'm still considering um, uh, do, doing a master class. I did one on, on how to write a short story um, simply because I thought it would be a bit different. So yes, you have to keep an inquiring mind. This is a continual growth. If you talk to any of the silks, um, they, they have inquired, none of them are sitting back going, oh, well, I'm silk, I don't need to do anything else. They're always looking for something else. So yes. Um, would you recommend listing all relevant positions of responsibility or including less with explanations? Don't just list anything. We don't know what the responsibility is. So you're better off using a few really well chosen um, examples and explaining why they are positions of responsibility and, and how, how they tie in, if possible, with um, moving forward. Um, how should a transferring lawyer answer the question, why do you want to be a barrister? Well, the same way as anybody else, um, Divya, um, why do you want to be a barrister? What is it that makes you want to transfer from um, the solicitor, as we would say, from the dark side to the light? Um, of course, they say it the other way around. Um, but uh, why do you want to? What is it that makes you here go, actually, I'm clever, I'm really good, I've got this, this um, profession as a solicitor, but I want to do that. What is it that makes you want to do that? Identify it, because I can't tell you. Only you can tell me. So identify it. What is it? Is it that you, um, you want to be self-employed? Um, is it that you want the freedom? Uh, is it that you can't get enough advocacy doing what you're doing because that's what you love? What is it that you think is the reason you want to go and expand on that? Um, Daryl, any thoughts on the best way to hand the translation of degree grades awarded overseas? Um, I can't really help very much with that. I think um, we tend to, to, we have quite a few international people anyway. So if somebody's got a query, we shall ask. Um, but if you can find some way of relating it to, you know, if you're on the Dean's list, list in America, I think it relates to a first vaguely, um, you explain to us if necessary. Um, what weight is given to applicants who are already undertaking court advocacy? How is that best translated into uh, an application? Um, well, obviously, get it into your ad the advocacy question for us, a different, different um, and into your work experience side of it. Um, how is it best translated into application? Put it in, your, in, in the work side of it. Mention it in your advocacy and say what you're doing. Um, but, but the fact is that if you come to us, we're going to make you start again with advocacy exercises and so forth. Um, it has some weight. It does have some weight, but it's, it's certainly not an overwhelming weight, um, but it's helpful. Uh, Reese, is it common for baby juniors to be led by senior members of chambers in more complex cases? Yes, sometimes. Um, you certainly get dragged in to help. I have uh, one of our pupils at the moment is acting as a junior to me on a horribly complicated director's case. Um, and uh, he will continue to act as my junior as he comes on stream. Um, how does 3PB treat applications from those with learning differences? Difficulties? We are very open. Um, we have um, I'm not going to mention any names, but we have people who've had head injuries. Uh, we make reasonable adjustments during the pupillage if we can. We have, an, we have somebody who comes in to assess to see what reasonable adjustments need to be made. Um, 
everything is, is um, we have uh, a very senior member of, of Chambers who, who has uh, quite severe dyslexia. Um, we help uh, with that as best we can. Um, you can do an awful lot with um, voice recognition uh, and with all of that kind of thing. We um, are happy to teach people touch typing if that's going to help, which it does sometimes, strangely, sometimes it can be easier for dyslexics to touch type for some reason. But um, so um, we, we do take quite a lot of steps. We have had a number of, of um, pupils with disabilities. Uh, would an application lose marks for not mentioning mooting? Probably, because mooting is really quite an important thing. Um, if you haven't done any and there's a reason, you're always best to explain it. If you have done mooting, just mention it. You know, I was the mistress of moots or I, I, did, uh, I did mooting at university. I found it very interesting. And then I've gone off and done something else with public speaking. Oh, hello, Alice. Um, do grades achieved on a musical instrument con con constitute an academic award? Um, not really, but please do mention it. Mention it in your interests, because um, we know that um, something like that on music or even sporting achievements um, are um, uh, things which not just round you out, but show an inquiring um, um, mind which looks outside, if you like, the, the nine dots, uh, somebody who's not blinkered uh, into law. It's really important to, to love law and want to do it, but um, to, to be quite frank, being over blinkered is not always a good idea. Uh, uh, my university is offering an option to complete the Telders MOOC competition. So should, would it put you to any disadvantage? Not from us, no, absolutely not, because uh, Presumably, it will be marked in the same way as a dissertation, and you will get your uh, your mark at the end, which is practically all we look at when it comes to the university. How much supervision do first six get? A lot, really, a lot. Um, we moved on to the bar council, what was then the pilot scheme for supervising um, pupils. So you have your pupil supervisor. Um, you do assessed work from day one. Um, uh, you do um, assessed written work. Every piece of written work you do gets a, a written assessment back. Uh, you do advocacy exercises. We have training days every four every four weeks or so, um, where we're um, dealing with what we think of as the added extra that gives you that just little bit of an extra mile. So, for example, how to lay out uh, orders, how to deal with orders, um, things that you don't do at bar school. So, lots. Um, and in fact, we continue with the, the supervision in, into the second six as well. Um, it's uh, we we tell our pupils that they have to be Velcro, even um, with the uh, the distance that we've had to do. I had a pupil last year. We met every morning at nine o'clock till ten o'clock on Zoom. Um, I was always available. We would exchange emails. We would exchange messages. Um, it's uh, it's hard work, but um, our pupils do seem to come out the other end actually really rather good. Um, she patted herself on the back. Uh, what is um, Chamber's position on mature students, second career applicants? We treat everybody the same. We have no objections to anybody older. I was older when I came to the bar, so we're certainly not going to have any injection, objections to it. Um, we have, starting with us next year, we have somebody who is practically straight out, will be straight out of bar school. Um, and we have somebody who, who is in their mid-30s who had another career. Um, the oldest pupil we've ever had uh, was in his 50s. So we're very, we're very laid back about it. Um, so having heard from recent pupils in a different pupillage event, I noted each pupil explained they were a pupil in one of the six different locations Chambers operates from. How does 3PB decide where a pupil will build their practice? Um, we don't, we, we do it in, in a sense in communication with you. Once you get to the second round, we will ask you to express your preferences as to where you want to be. Now, some um, specialities, if you want to be, for example, a criminal practitioner, um, you can't be in London and you can't be in Birmingham. Um, 
because we simply don't have the practices out of those two areas in, in crime. But you can be in Bournemouth, uh, you can be in uh, Winchester, which is our main criminal centre. Um, we talk to people about it. We, may, we, we ask people to rank where they'd like to be. Um, we, will make, we will make reasonable adjustments for people who have to be in a particular area, but only if we can actually um, support their, their um, particular area of pupillage. Um, uh, it's preferable you don't identify. We, we prefer you not to mention names, particularly 3PB names. It can cause difficulties. Um, it, it's simply that, um, you know, you do the mini pupillage and um, we don't mind you talking about the work you've done. We just rather you didn't identify uh, anybody. We, we think there are GDPR issues, Sharon. OK, uh, gosh, I'm getting an awful lot. We're running out of time a little bit, but I'll keep going if everybody's happy. I've still got 129 people listening, so I guess uh, you're, you're probably uh, listening. Um, should the application question about a reasonable judgment be some a, a recent judgment be something that's impacted on three PB's areas of practice? Um, no, the area of law you choose isn't isn't judged. Um, it's the explanation that you give. We're looking for a a reason why you've chosen that one and uh, a concise analysis of why you've chosen it and and what it's about. Um, that's all. We really don't mind uh, what it is. Um, Um, I've attended and argued my own tribunal hearings in relation to landlord and tenant in North America. Will this be? Yes, mention it. It won't have an adverse impact. Um, mention it by all means, because um, uh, it's advocacy um, and it doesn't matter that it was somewhere else. We're just looking for people who can talk and uh, or we want people who can talk and talk well. Um, Adoniki, um, the talk, thank you very much. Uh, I hope it has been helpful and I haven't spoken too quickly or thrown too much at you. Um, would not doing a minute at 3PB put you at any disadvantage? No, we have limited um, mini pupillages. We know this and particularly recently. Uh, it's been very, very difficult for us to organise them for a, a number of reasons. Um, so no, if uh, any mini pupillage. As I said, the mini pupillages really, we don't do assessed mini pupillages. We, we just want you to have done mini pupillages so that you know something about chambers. Um, right, I think that... Uh, um, I worked with one of your tenants during a trial to court as a county court advocate. Yes, you, you can mention it, but um, again, just be a little bit careful because um, what value does it add? I mean, we're not going to give you an extra mark because you've been against somebody. We're not going to go rushing off to that particular tenant and say, what did you think of this person? Because that would not be a fair or appropriate uh, method of recruitment um, either way. Um, so it may, every word you put on your, application form and I'm going to emphasize this again every word on your application form should be of use it should be something that will take your application forward um, I'm not sure that that would it might be worth if you get an interview mentioning it later on um, but I'm not sure it would really help um, would completing a master's carry enough weight to justify the cost of completing it um, depends. It really depends. Um, if you have a first class degree, um, then you don't really need, on our marking scheme, uh, you don't need a master's. Um, certainly not, not um, on the application form, because a first class degree um, will, will give you a, a very, very good intellectual mark anyway. Um, so I think it really depends on what your background is. Um, I mean, for, for example, we have had somebody who had a 2-2, um, went off and got themselves a master's in quite a difficult area of law, uh, ended up getting an interview and then sailing through the interviews. Um, so it really depends on your own background. If you think it would be helpful, fine. From our point of view, 
if you've got a very good degree or if you've got, um, for example, another qualification like chartered accountant or um, uh, something similar, you, you may not you may not need a master's. Uh, served as a justice of the student court. Um, I think it would probably qualify more as a position of responsibility. Um, I, 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 I'm not quite sure what a justice of the student court does. So it would depend if you're dealing with law, it might just get into work experience. But, but I, would, um, I would be more inclined um, to put it down as something else. Do I apply for people who after? Right. Um, I already answered this, actually, Natalia, but um, if you apply for a pupillage during your degree with us, um, you're unlikely to get an interview because an awful lot for us hinges on your degree uh, and what, what the level of your degree is. So if you apply before you've got that, um, you're, not, you're unlikely to get sufficient marks, no matter how brilliant you are and everything else. Um, because the level of competition is so high, you're unlikely to get sufficient marks for an interview. Other chambers do it differently. Um, thank you, Jasmine. That's very kind. Um, I'm thinking of starting to wind this up. Um, does anybody else, I'll give a couple of minutes, does anybody else have any more questions? Have I answered everything? Would advocacy experience of over a decade in a foreign jurisdiction outweigh to to? Um, don't know. It would depend on what the advocacy experience was, uh, and it would depend on what else you had. Um, with a two to you, as as I'm sure you know, in this world you are working at a disadvantage, but it's not absolutely hopeless. Are all two ones weighted equally? Yes. Um, if you've just missed out on a first. Um, it's probably worthwhile putting your marks up um, because if you're then borderline, we might just push it over the edge. Um, if you have a link to a geographical uh, location, for example, would you highlight this and why you want to be at 3PB? Um, in the initial um, sit, paper sift, uh, we don't ask people to say where they want to be and we don't particularly care where they want to be. We deal with that uh, when we've taken the numbers down from 300 to about 20. And then we start juggling with that. So um, it, it could be a reason why you'd like to come to 3PB, um, but it, it doesn't really carry an awful lot of weight. Um, oh, thank you, Rebecca. I love 3PB. I think it's a great place. It's a wonderful place to live, uh, to, to work. Um, uh, does the BPTC reset put you at a disadvantage for the application? Not necessarily. Depends what the resit's for. I mean, this year, to be quite, if it's this year, to be quite frank, there are going to be a lot of people doing resits who wouldn't do it in normal years. So probability is not. Uh, official grade prediction of distinction. Uh, could this make it worth applying, even though I haven't formally completed it yet? Um, yes. Um, you know, bung it in. Um, depends on what your degree is as well. But it, it all just adds, adds grist to the mill. Uh, how much weight is given to the BPTC grade compared to your university degree? A, an outstanding on the BPTC grade can, can um, push you up into the next category of mark um, on the intellectual side. So it, it, for us, it makes a huge difference. It can make an absolutely huge difference. Um, this is being recorded, so I think it's going to be sent to you all, uh, Tonica. So um, there you are, and we'll probably put it up on the website as well. Um, thank you, Matthew. Yes, it is a hugely diverse and supportive set. Um, it's, it's, it's great. I feel very at home there because, uh, although I may not sound it, I do have a slightly unusual background. Um, I think, I'm not sure, but I think I'm the only former hypnotherapist um, at the bar. Um, times you had difficulty with other people. You'd like some, ad, um, ad, well, let me just have a look. I might have something. Um, no, the the one I can think of with times I've had difficulties with other people um, have been where somebody's said that they had a difficulty with another person, but hasn't actually explained how they've dealt with it. And you need to deal with it. You really do. You need to explain what you did and how um, how, if possible, you fixed it. 
um, we, we did have one quite uh, last year where basically the person ran away, which doesn't help very much because you can't run away if you've got a really stroppy opponent. Um, good. Would only pass on the BPTC be marked down on an application? No, it, it, we, we, we start at zero and mark up um, on what's done. So, so it's not a question of a markdown. Uh, if you've got a pass on the BPTC, but you had a very good degree, um, that would still get you through. Good. Well, thank you all. <laughs> all right. No, because I'm no longer practicing, and I don't. Ha I don't have. Um, I don't have professional. Uh, and just in case anybody hasn't noticed that, would a pupil be entitled to a free hypnotherapy session with you ahead of their first hearing? I hope that by the time one of our pupils is ready for their first hearing. They wouldn't need a hypnotherapy session because our training is so awesome. Um, thank you, Rhys. Uh, good. Um, I am going to bring this to an end unless there is um, uh, something. Thank you, Alex. Uh, I'm a pure student who's had a career before. It's not a handicap. Um, I don't think you've quite finished that, Tonica. Do you want to just finish it very quickly? And um, No, students don't need, no, you don't need legal experience before. It's helped. I think as you get older, it does get more difficult. Um, and the reason for that is that um, obviously chambers, we put a lot of work into our pupils. Um, it's not just the award um, that we give, but our pupils get a lot of extra stuff. We put, we have our own training. Um, we put a lot of time into them. Um, they get a lot of extra things like uh, our pupils get free health care during their uh, free private health care during their pupillage year. Um, we give them free um, some some free um, applications and things. And um, so it, it starts to become a little more difficult. But um, we, we don't have any objection to anybody, anybody's age per se. Um, Great. Well, thank you all very much for attending. I think we've dropped down to 91. So uh, perhaps the time has come for me to say goodbye. Thank you all very much for attending. I hope I didn't speak too quickly or too much. Um, I hope it's been helpful. Um, how much time does a student have to give back after? I'm not quite sure what that means. Um, if you mean... Um, if you have pupillage and you are off a tenancy, um, well, we don't specify how long you have to stay with us after pupillage. Um, we do specify that anybody who's done their pupillage in a particular centre needs to continue to operate out of that centre for at least two years afterwards, because that centre will have put that work into them. Um, and um, uh, we don't. We don't expect our pupils to pay anything back. Um, we, our process, we believe, picks the best um, and we work with them and we hope that all of them will make tenancy. Can I wish you all the very best of luck? Um, as I said earlier, I think you are doing this in a really, really difficult time. I know how hard it's been for a lot of you. Um, if we could do more, we would. Um, but uh, if you do need any additional help, please do. Um, you can get in touch with us through our pupillage um, uh, email address. James Thornton is our admin guy if you need any help with admin. Um, and um, I wish you the very best and thank you very much. <laughs>